You are looking live at the Atlantic Ocean in Lake Worth, Florida, the location for the 2015 Diversity in Aquatics Convention. I'm Lee Pitts, the host of Conversations with Lee Pitts, where we get a chance to talk to some of the great aquatic professionals in all the land. Welcome to Conversations. We're here with Marion, one of the persons who was very instrumental in making all of this come to a reality with diversity in aquatics. Marion, tell us about your role and uh, big thanks for all the hard work you put in. Oh, thank you. Uh, my role here with diversity in aquatics is I am director of operations. So I ensure that we run successfully as an organization, which we've been doing for the last several years. Um, it has helped us tremendously uh, to work as a team um, with the staff that we have to have our third convention here in the wonderful Lake Worth, Florida. Tell us, you said third convention, tell us what, what how the, the progress from convention one to convention two and to now where we are today and then looking forward to the fourth convention in 2016. Um, when the first convention happened it was more of just trying to find a way, a tool to gather up all of these different aquatic professionals. And we were just really in our infancy in that idea. And now we've grown into what each, our CEO has wonderfully said, our toddler phase. And we are a full grown organization. We are a functioning organization that are actual people doing things in their community. As diversity in aquatics, we are doing things out in the community. We've done a number of events. We've made some partnerships happen. And that's what this convention is about, is to acknowledge and celebrate what we've done and also to start planning forward for our next big product which is our camps that we'll host next year at Nova Southeastern University. And, and talk about that. Uh, we are really excited about the partnership that we have with Nova Southeastern to host a camp. And so what that would do is combine youth um, and actually youth with adults. And with that purpose, it is about to make the influence and expose our youth to what aquatics are. Um, and being able to chance to say, oh, this is rowing, this is water polo, um, and the opportunities that are afforded. And also know historically what has happened in the past. Um, I think it's important for our youth to know what has happened and where we're going forward. So they can be a part of it too. Now they can go to that website that's on the screen and find out more details about it. But kind of summarize, it's going to be that actually had the opportunity they're coming in from out of town. They actually be able to stay in the dormitories on the college campus. We're going to be seeing some images of that and uh, the beautiful swimming facility that a lot is going to take place in. Sort of run us through that. Oh, North of South, Nova Southeastern is probably one of the best facilities, best gym kept secrets here in South Florida. Um, state of the art uh, facilities, uh, we have wonderful access to their pools and other aquatic programs that they have going there. Um, and it, it just makes that program even better for next year. And you can find all the information, we will have it up on our website even um, before the end of this convention. What is the primary mission of diversity in aquatics? Diversity in aquatics, the foundation of what we are is uh, to curb the drowning statistics for minorities. And from that, we have developed programs to enhance and to help with that curbing education, promotion, and support of one another when we're going out and doing these things. Talk about uh, what happened, what has happened here this weekend at this particular conference and how that's going to spill over to next year. Uh, what's happened here at this convention is that we are working towards getting ready for the camps and we are bringing together as I said is the programs that we've done before and we're evaluating them seeing where we should uh, go forward with them and making them even better for 2016 and how can they incorporate into our camps each of our councils that we have that you can find on our um, on our structure it are working towards how can they integrate into the camp scene and educate our youth and other adults about about what are what are the possibilities in aquatics? How can governing bodies for various aquatics organizations uh, become a part of what we're doing here at Diversity Aquatics? Talk to them out there. They can come to uh, and a part of our organization by coming on our website. We have a sponsorship grants um, person who is Rhonda Maribel, who's done a wonderful job in getting information out. Uh, if we are looking for partnerships, we want you to be involved. Um, and please, you can contact any of us on the website who are part of the executive board or part of our advisory board members, and we will put you in the right direction to make that partnership happen. Do you have to be an accomplished swimmer to be a member or a part of what the diversity and aquatics movement is all about? 
No, you don't have to be an accomplished swimmer. That is what our, our unique trait is. That is that you don't have to be that accomplished swimmer. You don't have to have all the expertise, but we will come and help you out to get to that next level. Okay, people with like minds, with like goals, and looking to help other people get involved. Uh, did you ever think uh, 10 years ago that you would see something like this come to fruition? Uh, actually, yes, I do. I do think that I, I graduated Did. from Howard University, um, and I had a great atmosphere there at Howard University with uh, the swimmers and the team environment. When I went off to the professional world, I missed that. I, I, I knew there had to be some way. How can we connect? I knew there were others out there from my swimming experience. And I was always, how do you, you know, besides, you know, oh, a text message or, you know, small communication, how could we come together? So um, I got involved with swimming, and actually that's how I met uh, our CEO, Sean Anderson, is through the uh, a USA Swimming Venture um, called the Diversity Summit. And he explained what he was doing in the movement for diversity in aquatics, and it just fulfilled that need I had to connect with other like minds, other people who are doing things and taking um, information and broadcasting and telling about the opportunities and connecting with others like yourself that were doing things in the community. So. Well, you are so passionate and work so hard and you volunteer and you just, I mean, you wake up thinking about diversity in aquatics, huh? Yes, I do. <laughs> I do, but it's just, you know, um, I learned something great. Once you find something that you love, it's not work. Um, and this is something that I love and something I believe in. Um, and this is my gift to the world. This is what God has afforded me uh, the ability to do. And this is what I feel is everything has come together. So I'm very thankful for that. All right. If we, if it wasn't for a person like Marion, none of this would happen. She does it. She's like uh, modest about a lot of things. But I want to make sure I give her her due praise right here on, on this documentary. And uh, we hope that everybody will come out next year to participate in this because if you missed it, you miss it. Thanks for joining yes, us. Thank you so much for having me. This is awesome. All right, this is Lee Pitts. I'm back. We've got good visual. Okay, I'm sitting here with Sean Anderson. He's the, one of the founders of Diversity in Aquatics that's now starting to sweep the country. Uh, without Sean, uh, we wouldn't be here today. He's doing something that's pioneering for the sake of history. Uh, we're, we're sitting here in uh, Lake Worth at uh, one of the resort areas. Sean, talk about some of the things that are taking place today and what will take place tomorrow at this fabulous Diversity in Aquatics conference. Uh, at the conference today, we have a moment in history where we talk about some of the accomplishments of our members and our advisory board that they've done in the past, really holding on to our history and legacy of diversity in aquatics, uh, which is a precursor to moving the future of diversity in aquatics forward in all aquatic disciplines. Uh, we're also discussing how we help other organizations move forward, be it a report card, be it uh, uh, more activities and more events into the future that, that we're planning. We have a, a, a great group here that's really making some really uh, uh, fabulous moves forward. Uh, we've also hit the research component and position papers of our, our group of experts in, in the field of diversity in aquatics. Uh, and, kind of pointing the way to better uh, uh, diversify all aspects of every sport and activity invo involving water. Why in the heck anyway would anybody care about having diversity in aquatics? I think ultimately it points back to the drowning rate, Lee, where, uh, you know, it, it's through the roof. It's been through the roof for, some, for quite some time. And uh, the thought of uh, I think it arrives there from a multiple number of variables, whether it be historic, culturally, access, hair, uh, or, or just even basic instruction. You add those up and obviously you get the, health, the disparity where it is. Now, to combat that, we're going to have to have a bunch of variables. It's like an equation, Lee. You can't have you know, all these variables on one side and think the resolve is just going to be one variable on this side. Sean, when you see this wide variety of people who come here from all over the country to particip participate in this conference, how does that make you feel personally from the time you, that you and your, your partner, Jason, start having this vision, say, eight years ago, to now see it manifest itself in reality? Uh, it's exciting because collectively, uh, this group can move things forward. You know, uh, by ourselves, we couldn't. You know, so that's exciting, and we have our portion of the, the relay in, in working on trying to solve and move this needle and, and progress things. So it's exciting to be working as a, a group uh, and a network uh, and, and, and all the powerful minds in the room 
are just just blow me away in terms of ideas and, and, and positioning and and, and, and and enthusiasm, if you will. Now, people who are looking at this now on on uh, on the website and they see in the background all these people uh, networking and talking. Uh, I want you guys to know that we're at a, a slight break now. We're going to start back some more educational topics with Thaddeus is going to be speaking. But uh, tell them about the networking opportunity abound that takes place at this conference. Uh, here at the conference, uh, you know, it's kind of twofold. Uh, as a group, we talk about how things can move nationally and internationally and how we're going to make a difference, you know, in those statistics. Uh, but you also, during these breakouts and the other social opportunities, get to move things to how you can change in your community and get best practices and everything else. So it's a collective effort uh, as well as a hometown. What do I need to go back and do to move things back at home? And what do I need to do to add to the pot to move things forward? As a, as a big glacier effect, if you will. There you go. Outstanding. This is Sean Anderson for history's sake. Remember, he's one of the founders of Diversity and Aquatics, a national organization, international organization. Okay, now, for the first time at the Diversity Aquatics Conference, we have some girls, some youths to bring on camera. I am so thrilled because this is the next generation and they actually swim black girls, Puerto Ricans slash whatever, they swim. I think, you, I think you mixed with some Puerto Rican and stuff too, right? Your mom. So, I think so. Okay, let's get your name first, how old you are, and what school you go to. Let's start with that. Okay, so my name is Julianne Gillette, and I'm 13 years old, and I go to Edgar Allan Poe Middle School, and I'll be going into the eighth grade in September. Now, where is Edgar Allan Poe Middle School located? What city? Um, Annandale, Virginia. Virginia, okay. What part of Virginia? Annandale. Okay. And so we got some students here from Virginia. You saw us talk to their mom earlier. And what's your name and what school you go to? Um, my name is Jan Janelle Chalette, and I am 12 years old, and I go to the same school, Edgar Allan Poe Middle School. Okay. Now, both of you are swimmers. If you can remember, what age did you start swimming? Um, I think around five <laughs> see the reason I ask that question people a lot of people who are exposed to aquatics at an early age particularly they don't remember when they learn how to swim say for example my little boy that I'm teaching to swim now he's five six years old he's not going to remember when he learned how to swim because he learned at such a young age okay what strokes do you swim um, I swim all strokes freestyle Backstroke, butterfly, and breaststroke. But my favorite stroke is breaststroke. Breaststroke. Why breaststroke? Because you win? Well, I don't know. It just, well, before I was not a breaststroker at all. I did not like breaststroke. But then my coach, um, Coach Elvin, started, you know, helping me in breaststroke. And I started to really like it. So it's my best stroke. Great. Now, I'm going to use that as a learning point, too. Just because you're not as good or as fast in one stroke, you should learn other strokes. You'll be surprised that you may be a great butterfly or a back crawler and you're not as good in freestyle, the front stroke. Now, many of you are not gonna be the fastest in freestyle because everybody swims freestyle. So learn some other strokes. You may have a strong whip kick or a dolphin kick that you didn't even know that you had and you could be the best butterfly or breast stroker just because your body and everything else works out well for the kicks. What stroke do you swim? I swim breast stroke as well, but I don't have a choice. I have to swim all strokes either if I like it or not. But I chose breast stroke when I was younger. I was a backstroker as well. I kind of lost backstroke when I was 10, 11, 12, but then I got back into it this summer. So I guess I'm a backstroker and, and a breast stroker right now. Now, are you swimming IM as well? Yes, I am. I would say it might be like the 400 I am right now. I'm trying to work on that, but that's like my favorite event right now. Okay, now this is where you become a, a new a sports anchor. You're gonna When you grow up, you're going to be on television talking about swimming. Tell the TV audience, you know, simple as you can, what is I am? Individual medley. I am is when you take all four strokes, back, breast, fly, and free, and you swim them in one event. So that doesn't mean you're going to swim, fly, then pause, and then back, and then pause, and the rest. So what you do, it's one event. So you're going to start off with butterfly. You swim one length of, of the pool of butterfly, and then you turn, and you go into your backstroke and swim the other length, and then you go into breaststroke, and then freestyle, and that's the end of the event. Okay. 
tell us how you I don't even have to ask I don't have to ask you if you're making good grades swimmers make good grades how are you balancing your books and your swim team practices I don't know really I think I, I just like school I like learning about certain things but I have morning practices so this year I'll be doing three morning practices before school and then I'll have time after school to work on school work when I'm not having other activities tell us what's it like I'll be over here to you in a minute tell us what's it like to have mom hovering over you pushing you do, it, do when you look back at it right now do or you appreciate what mom does for you I do appreciate what she does for me, but like some days you'll be like, I don't want you here. But at the end of the day, you really want your mom to be there or someone that will support you through your swimming, your school or other things that you love to do. Great. Now, uh, she and you, you, she started swimming before you. Were, was she your role model when you saw your big sister swimming? Did you say, okay, I want to do that? Or are you always over there petting around like Serena and Venus Williams? You over there watching your big sister and say, hey, I'm going to do this. Um, really? I don't know. I just, well, when Gian started swimming, I was just, you know. Hanging swimming, around the pool. Hanging around the pool, just watching. But then I know when I was um, five, I was like, well, it, it kind of looks fun. I it kind of interests me a little, so I guess I just started swimming. Okay, well, uh, I know you're making good grades in school too. Tell us about your typical day when you have to go to swim team practice and you have to go to school. Tell us how you you. I think you might swim in the morning before you go to school. Walk us through that so people can understand that commitment. Um. So last year we like we did morning practice on wednesdays and then you know we might double up and then we have school and but like right after school you go to practice go ahead yeah right after school but in the mornings i do not like the morning practices at all getting up there in cold water <laughs> yeah but i think like it's it's a good schedule i get to learn go to school and then after that i go to swim practice do people at school know that you're on the swim team and, and, and uh, how do they react to that? Do your friends know that you're one of the top swimmers around? Um, well, some of them, like, they asked me, like, like, what do you do? Like, do you do any um, sports? And I was like, yeah, I do swimming. And she's like, really? And so I just tell them, like, like what team I'm on. And, and then I tell them that I'm like, I don't try not to brag. Right. But, you know, I tell them that I'm like, I'm the third fastest in breaststroke of, well, I used to. In the district? Yeah. Okay. Now, you got trophies and medals and ribbons and all that at home? Yes. <laughs> and you got trophies and medals and ribbons and all that at home? Many. <laughs> Many, see? Now, who's the fastest? So you still keeping little sister in check? Um, I think we're equally as fast. Oh, really? She's caught up? Well, she's caught up in some events, but in other events, I got her. Like. All right, good. Your side of the story. wanted to be here and so you know since now I'm a breast choker and she's a breast choker I try to try to be in their breast choke and so she pushes me a lot and so that's yeah. great so you, you want you don't want little sister beating you you're making little sister better now you know that right because you're swimming against competition I'm sure mom tells you that well girls it's just been just a thrill to have both of you here the first girls kids to be on this documentary and you guys are gonna take the future forward and I hope you learn a lot here today you. Thank you so much. We'll be right back. Okay, welcome back to uh, Lee Pitch Live here at the Diversity Aquatics Conference. We are back as we promised and we told you we would deliver the chairman of the advisory council. And I'm so fortunate to be able to get him here. He's a busy man. His name is Ken Rowland. I know you guys have seen him in other documentaries. In the past, he wasn't the chairman of the advisory council. Now we have a uh, dynamic chairman to continue to take this movement forward. So without further ado, let's meet Ken Rowland here in the Fort Lauderdale area. Ken, welcome to uh, uh, the convention here, 2016. Uh, first of all, tell us about your responsibility as the chairman of the advisory council, the most important council in all of the uh, diversity aquatics uh, pieces. 
Well, number one, I'd like to just say thank you, Lee, for, for having me here. And, and I've been voluntold to be the chairperson by Mr. Lee Pitts myself. Uh, that I'm supposed to do this. So the thing is we need to next make sure that we have the leadership uh, for people who are um, not necessarily aware of a lot of different things. So here we are. We are in the third annual convention and as the chairperson of the advisory board where we have a membership of Mr. Lee Pitts as well as Arthur Lopez. Uh, who's just a dynamic person that, that has a, a trend, fantastic curriculum uh, concerning new and innovative ways how you could teach swimming. We also have, uh, actually we have an Olympian on our board right now who is a Maritza McClendon who's just an amazing individual. Uh, I had the privilege of meeting her at the International Hall of Fame in 2012 when uh, I got my award, so which was great. And then uh, we also have the legendary Mr. Jeff Ellis. Um, Jim? Yeah, Jim. I was, thank you. Jeff, you know Jeff, you know Ellis. Oh my God, I just made a, 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 Go ahead. a, but I want you to understand, Jim Ellis is just uh, an amazing guy. And we're, one of the things that we're going to do is provide a scholarship fund in his name for people who want to go on these several different tracks concerning uh, uh, aquatics. One of them. I know Jim is, he's ill. He's not here with us at this conference. And uh, of course, you, many of you remember Jim is that movie Pride was based on his life about the black swimmers that everybody would come to us and say hey that movie reminded us of us and all that but uh jim get well soon and uh jim we want to let ken roll and say what your life experiences and what you accomplished with the uh, uh pdr the philadelphia uh, uh department of recreation swim team and all those other accomplishments meant to him talk to jim he's looking at you right now well, hi, Jim, and I just want to say uh, my hat's off to you. I really, truly hope you feel better. Um, and I just wanted to know, I want everybody to know that that story that was portrayed in Pride is the same or which is very typical of everything that, that uh, the folks before us have, have gone through. And even myself, you know, I can even say, even Lee yourself, I mean, we can all identify with some of those things that, uh, and adversities and challenges that he has to go, that he had to go through that was delineated in that movie. So I just want to give a warm uh, shout out to my brother, uh, Jim uh, Ellis, and I really hope that you feel better. And the thing is, the things that you have done also mirror so many other people's lives and it just acts as a good uh, role model and uh, we just want to make sure that people can understand the history and the things that we go through as people who are developing uh, programs in aquatics on the minority front. And that movie has done a lot in terms of our movement to move uh, aquatics forward for people of all races and colors to to getting engaged in that wonderful sport. Uh, today here, tell people where we are and uh, what's going to happen uh, for the remainder of the today at the conference and tomorrow. Well, some general things. Well, in general, we're here in the beautiful town of Lake Work, Florida. It's just an amazing venue to have our uh, convention. It's uh, we're here at the Lake for Lake uh, Worth Casino building, which is just a fantabulous. Uh, if I can pan to the uh, left or you can pan to the right, I, everywhere I look, I can see the picturesque uh, uh, venue here with trees and boats and water, and it's just a fantastic place. It's it's almost like a Shangri-La kind of place, isn't it? It's very tropical in nature, and that's the cool thing about being here. So one of the things you can do is as we go forward with our next convention next year, you make sure that you put it on your calendar that in July, I believe it's July 25th of next year, is when our next convention is gonna be starting. So you wanna make sure you put that on your calendar. Now as far as some of the things that you will experience, one of the things here is this, is that common best practices when it comes to any of uh, the aquatic arenas like rowing, like teaching swimming lessons, like becoming a pool manager, like uh, becoming involved in a multiplicity of, of, of scuba and, and the multiplicity of job opportunities here in aquatics. And 
there are so many opportunities for everybody. Everywhere you go, there's a swimming pool uh, at the municipality. So that means there's a job for someone. And that also means there's a job for someone um, in management as well, as well as doing a whole bunch of things. So uh, I'm really excited about the Diversity in Aquatic Initiative here. And we're bringing all the elements of the aquatic arena together so that we can excel, especially people of color like ourselves. Well, Ken, it's been a pleasure having you stop by, and uh, we're looking forward to an ongoing uh, successful weekend here. Well, thank you so much, Lee. And I just wanted to say we have so many superheroes. I'm wearing a superhero shirt right now, but we have so many superheroes and, and role models that you'd really be missing out on a chance to experience something truly special. Come and visit us again here at the Diversity in Aquatics convention for 2016. This guy is turning into a TV guy overnight, right? <laughs> That's because I hang out with you. <laughs> okay, we'll be right back. Welcome back to the Diversity Aquatics 2015 uh, convention. I want to thank God for allowing me to be able to attend three of these and keep on cranking out these documentaries for those who are looking at us on the Diversity Aquatics uh, website. We are growing in leaps and bounds and we, we're so proud to have our new di director of outreach, fundraising. How would you describe yourself? Uh, What's that title? The, t the title is Director of Partnerships, Sponsorships, and Grants. All right, give us your full name and a little background on you. My name is Ron Marable. I am a second year attendee of the Diversity in Aquatics Convention. Uh, I'm the former multicultural PR manager at USA Swimming, and now I do the Diversity in Aquatics work full time. Uh, former NCAA water polo player, um, played for the national team as a junior, and just a general aquatic individual. I th I'm getting into outrigger canoeing. I've been doing that for about two years and that's my new aquatic passion. What city and state do you physically live in? I'm currently in San Francisco, California. That's why I want to bring in that flavor to you guys who are watching this. Uh, we have people who come in here from all over the country. This is the place to be if you're interested in diversity, you're interested in aquatics. This is the clearinghouse, the diversity in aquatics. Now why would you fly all the way across the country two years in a row to participate in this and is it worth it? My personal motivation for coming to Diversity in Aquatics is because I get to be around people that are like me. I'm, I'm used to being the only one in the room who, who's black who does the things that I do and it's, it's a little bit of a different experience um, and so now I get to be in a room of people where we know what it's like to be the first, we know what it's like to be the only and it's absolutely worth it for me to come here and to do all of this traveling and to to get an experience that I wouldn't otherwise get in my sports. Now you have a thousand of people who are looking at you now and many of them may want to get a, a involved with diversity aquatics particularly some of the big governing bodies uh, tell them how they can be associated with diversity and aquatics in terms of sponsorship involvement and branding and how that can benefit them. Uh, the strength of diversity in aquatics is in our network. Access to a network of diverse aquatic professionals with the expertise in their fields. I think for the national governing bodies, it's especially important for you to know that here, diversity in aquatics is a collection of experts who know how to get programs out to the communities, specifically that are sports related so I think that we have an opportunity to create a package of consulting services and advertisement because we are in tune we have our pulse we are the communities so for national governing bodies learning how to recruit more talent and minority communities coming to diversity and aquatics is really the only place you're going to get our expertise and so having a partnership and sponsoring diversity and aquatics initiatives and events is is you're you're getting basically a, a pass into the communities you want to be in when you come to these conventions well first of all if you want to email address or something that you want to give out right now if people want to contact you for more information uh, get involved uh, go ahead and provide that now Anybody interested in sponsorship can contact me at Rhonda, R-H-O-N-D-A, at diversityinaquatics.org. Okay. When you come to these conventions, 
uh, as a person who's already skilled in the field, what do you learn? What do you learn something and what do you hope to take away? I hope to learn how we can execute the the ideas that we have. I think that we all we have very strong ideas about how we're going to create programs, how we're going to get money. And I think that having people here, we can put action into it. So I, my motivation is really getting to how are we going to do this, getting some deadlines in place, getting some goals in place, um, so that we're not just talking about it, we're being about it. Okay. And finally, I don't know if you realize this, that uh, your position in diversity aquatics is the most important position in our organization. I want you to feel that pressure. But the idea that you are willing to step up and be a part of that pressure says a lot about you as a person. What did you get that? What did you get this? Hey, I want to step up. I want to, I want to uh, make a difference. I... I feel the pressure. I, I take it very personally, and I think that it's just in my personality. I, I I'm a student of business growth, and I and I've worked with a lot of startup companies. And one of the things I know is like, how do you take a great product, which is diversity in aquatics, and how do you scale that for growth? And the only way you can do that is to sell it. The only way you can do that is to get funding for the things that you want to do. And I think that I see us all, it's like we're on the cusp of the greatness like in diversity and aquatics. And I think really what we need now is an infusion of funding to really get over that hump and to make the biggest difference. And I think that, you know, when I sit here and I talk about, I see the ideas that people have, I'm just thinking. In my mind, it, it's really funny, but in my mind, it's just like dollar signs chinging because I'm like, how are we going to pay for this? Because, I, I mean, this is all I think about 24-7. And hey, especially with a guy like me who's always talking about doing stuff for free. <laughs> You're the real me. I, I do, I'm like, no, nothing for free. I'm like, we can, get, we can get this funded because it's important work and, and we're worth it. This is absolutely worth it. This is an industry that makes money. And I actually think that we're only going to make more money if we get minorities involved. You know? Okay. So, everybody out there, we're going to come back with another outstanding person in the field of aquatics. Everybody is here, folks. If you missed it, you missed it. We'll be right back. Uh, we welcome back to the uh, Diversity Aquatics Conference. Uh, we got another dynamic person here, outstanding in the field of aquatics. He's doing some, some great work. I've got to see him in action. <laughs> he's, he's, uh, he's made a name for himself throughout the state. And uh, we'll get his name and, 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 and what he does. Let's go. Trevor Kelly, Jr., from Jamaica. Uh, I am the uh, Veterans Tri Council uh, underneath the triathlon. I also did 10 years in the military, in the Army. I was uh, involved in interrogation slash uh, supply and infantry. Um, I got out in 2008. Once I got out of there, I met Thaddeus, which is the triathlon, or he used to be the triathlon council. He's now uh, co-chair uh, committee. He actually introduced me into triathlon. In the council chair. He introduced me in 2009 uh, to triathlon. I met him in Weston. And from there, asking him questions about how to, to, uh, to run my bike a little bit more efficiently, he got me into swimming. And then from swimming into running, he helped me break my first 10 mile run uh, in 2010. So, 10 miles? Yeah, 10 miles. Woo! We had a long time to talk. <laughs> hey, that is man. That is, I got to get that is over for the interview, but that is has a way of inspiring people, motivating people, building consensus and getting things done. Say something about that is and, 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 and how you think he's able to, to do that. He has a natural gift. Uh, I'm not sure if it's his warmth that he has or if it's how he communicates with other folks when he talks to you he's very genuine and I think that's what it is we don't we don't have a lot of communication with people who are genuine um, he loves what he does this, whether it be triathlon talking about life uh, diversity in aquatics he's he's a uh, he's a very warm genuine person Real committed right and let's talk about uh, at the Boys and Girls Club about two years ago when I first met you. You guys came out and you did this something. I thought I had seen everything in aquatics, folk. 
this was just fabulous. Uh, can't give all the details. We may have some photos that flash as this interview goes on with my editor. I'll get him some pictures. But uh, describe that what, what 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 we saw there. What, what what were you guys doing in the water with those kids running in the water with those those ropes attached to them and that whole what's that called, man? All right. Well, that program that Thaddeus initially initially started, uh, Sphere of Fun. So what it is is that we have um, it's basically the styrofoam belts. Um, each line in the pool, the separation for the lines, the kids were tethered um, and they were spaced out on odd numbers there, spaced out. We had, I think it was more than 30 kids. Um, but basically, on every other person, the person was tethered out going opposite directions. And so you had the right lane and the left lane running opposite directions, pulling at the same cord. All the kids, all 15 kids on each line were pulling in the opposite direction. And one of the things I noticed about that whole thing, it was like great exercise, cardio, everything. It, you know what? Um, I think that's the hardest exercise to do outside of hitting the pavement or going out for a bike or going straight swim. Because you're not only engaging your core, you're not only engaging the, uh, the, the, the water, you're also engaging the person behind you. Along with the other several people that's drawing your line there. Those kids loved it. And you guys came out and you put some mirrors in the, on, the, on the bottom of the pool and kids could actually see themselves look down while they're swimming, looking at themselves swimming. The mirror was at the surface of, uh, at the, on the on the on the on the uh, surface of the pool. That, the mirrors, I think, are the most dynamic part of that that uh, that training program because even the most veteran uh, swimmer, it's different when you see yourself on the bottom of the pool and you see your stroke, you see your pool, you see your come your head coming out, coming back down. It's different than even when you watch yourself in a video or if somebody's sitting there talking to you. When you actually see. All your application, uh, how you're actually uh, taking on the water, it's it's night and day, especially for someone who's never swam before. Okay, and also people, again, this is the the national conference here, and he his his ancestry traces him back to Jamaica. So again, you're seeing the diversity of people from all over the world who are coming here participating in this convention. Tell me, um, what are you learning? How does this inspire you every year when you come to something like this? Well, as being part of the Veterans Council, um, I have to communicate with folks who may not um, have that urgency to want to wanna participate in water sports. But it's after they find out that all the elements that happen once they get into the water, whether they have injury, whether it be physical, mental, uh, substance abuse, or they're having some other issues that they have to deal with and they're still on active duty or they've been out of the military, once they find out that swimming, it's a social platform. It's a uh, it's a character builder. You get yourself in physical shape. Um, that unity process that we have uh, in the military, when you're part of a team, once they get swimming and they become a group, they understand that you know there's a lot of benefits to it. Um, so it's it's a it's a it's a large large part. The Veterans Council is a part of diversity in aquatics. Is uh, pillars uh, tell people who are watching how they can get in touch with you. And how, what does the Veterans Council do? Okay, well, I'll start with what we do. Um, between myself and Dad is, as a team, we're working with the VA, we're working with the Army National Guard, one Air Force uh, unit in Homestead Air Force Base. Basically, what I'm doing is I'm opening the opportunity for soldiers returning back from battle, whether, whether it be battle or whether they just got off active duty or reserve status. I'm opening the door and opportunity for the family, for themselves to learn how to swim, um, to participate in training um, programs to help them learn how to participate and complete their first triathlon. Um, and that is being done because we need to, to, to have that avenue so that when these guys come back, they lost that I'm a part of a team and kind of recreate that, 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 uh, that environment. But now, they're, now they're, uh, they're able to actually be a product of their own positive energy in the water, uh, like I said, a social platform. So, whether it be that they have an injury, whether it be physical, mental, I'm opening that door, and I'm also engaging in the military, um, and some of the local leaders here, staff, uh, chain of command, to open um, avenues of communication between diversity and aquatics and the Army National Guard. What does that do? What has been the response from the veterans or people that you're involved with to your program? Um, 
the first response, I'll be honest, it was a lot of uh, tension. Uh, we're more concerned about training people to battle. We're not concerned about when they come back uh, gotcha. right out the hand, right out, right out the bat. Um, but after the first or second conversation with um, the chain of command and with the soldiers during the drill on the weekend, um, it's been a, a more open, uh, positive communication between ourselves and the chain of command there. Um, them knowing that they're going to go ahead and uh, bring in this positive environment, the soldiers going to have a place to go ahead and say, you know what, I can stay physically fit, I can bring my family into it. It becomes a very collective thing that, you know, will push them forward in their military careers. Excellent. Give an email address and, and or a phone number where people can get in touch with you with more details on what you do and if they want to be a part of what you do here as well with the uh, Diversity Aquatics. Yes, uh, you can reach me at Trevor Kelly Jr. at Hotmail.com. That's uh, T-R-E-V-O-R-K-E-L-L-Y-J-R at Hotmail.com. Or you can reach me on my cell phone, which is 954-552-0239. There we go again, people. You just never know who you're going to see at the Diversity Aquatics uh, Convention. Here we got a guy here who's working with veterans who've come back from, from their service to this country, helping them re-energize get themselves back in the mainstream and of course he may deal with some people with a mental physical they may not have a leg they may not have an arm but that water can get them back rolling all that's happening right here and he's and he's black i mean he's actually black oh you didn't know black folk do this well you know now thanks man for joining us no problem man. i appreciate it thank you man. we'll be right back welcome back to waters a conversation with Lee Pitts at the Diversity and Aquatics 2015 convention. And I have sitting next to me, I, I know you guys said, when is he going to stop bringing all of these unbelievable people on camera? And I'm meeting all these people here. And, and I've heard about this guy. I've heard about the swim meet. I've never gone to it, folk. I know y'all who watch this say, hey, Lee Pitts has never come. All those years he's been in aquatics, he's never come to the swim meet. And I apologize for that, but I, look, I think I'm going to make it this year. And, uh, but I have some stuff. I, be, I have stuff that I be doing. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but it's so great to get you here, man. When did you, well, first of all, tell us a little bit about your background, your full name. Uh, my name is Rob Green. I'm the competitive swimming program manager for DC Parks and Recreation. Uh, I've been doing that for 10 years now. Um, I'm a native Washingtonian, so I grew up swimming in the city. Um, swam high school at St. Albans School. Um, that's, yeah, that's pretty much it for me. Right. And the, 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 your, I would say one of your flagship e events is the Black History Month Swim Meet. Tell people what that is coming up on the 30th anniversary. Yeah, definitely. That's one of our marquee events. Um, usually we have over 900 participants in the meet, teams from all over the country, uh, north, south, east and west, New York, Chicago, uh, Virginia, Florida, Georgia. I mean, you name it. Uh, we, I think last year we even had a team from St. Lucia. Um, this is our 30th year. Uh, it's held every President's Day weekend. Um, so this year the dates are February 12th through the 14th. Um, it's in Washington, D.C., uh, and it takes place over the course of three days. Um, so we have events from the 50 freestyle all the way up to 500 free. We have a 400 IM, 200 fly. Um, the meet is situated right before most championship meets in March, so it's a great last chance qualifier for those swimmers that are trying to get those, those cuts. Um, and it's just a really positive experience. There's a lot of energy in the air. It's electric. Um, so, if you come to that meet, chances are you're going to walk away with a personal best swim. Anything uh, going to happen special on the 30th anniversary? Um, we're still working on our honorees for this year. Um, there's a rumor that perhaps FLOTUS, Michelle Obama, might come and visit us, um, but that has yet to be confirmed. So, um, But uh, we're, we're definitely going to have some surprises for you guys, some, some great events, um, and of course, always fast swimming. Okay, you got a chance to, you're here today, uh, this weekend, 
for the first time seeing you come out to the Diversity and Aquatics Convention. Uh, from you know, and you've been around for a minute. What what do you th what, what what are you taking away? What are you learning? How do you like it? What's your thoughts about what you've experienced so far today? It's definitely just inspirational. I mean, to be in a room with like-minded individuals who share your passion um, and just to sharing ideas. Um, it's it's inspirational. I mean, just today, just I've only been here for a few hours and I've already met some folks that probably want to partner with in the future um, to bring some programs back to the district. Um, so that that's my biggest takeaway after this first day is just I'm just inspired. You know, I, I, I already want to go home and get back to work. I'm supposed to be on vacation right now, but I'm ready to get back to work already. Um, so yeah, that's my biggest takeaway from it. What do you see? What are some ways you see that um, diversity and aquatics can partner uh, with, with some of the things that you're doing out there and, and, and continue to grow grow the movement? Definitely just raising awareness. I mean, you know, aquatics is bigger than just competitive swimming. I mean, I learned that today. There's rowing programs. There's um, there's triathlon like triathlon programs. Um, there's diving programs. I mean, I met uh, Mr. Mr. Lumpkins today. Had no idea he was this world famous <laughs> diver. Um, so, you know, it just raising awareness that aquatics is bigger than just competitive swimming um, and, and trying to bring that back to, to the district. Okay, man, it's just been a thrill to have you here and um, to when I found out who you were, it was like, hey, we got to get him on camera. You just quiet. I saw you sitting back there quietly going through. I guess everybody else knows who you are, but I didn't know who you were. So I'm so thrilled that you joined us here and uh, uh, keep up the good work. Okay. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. And we'll be right back. Welcome back to Diversity Aquatics. Uh, I don't think I got a chance to talk to you last year, but I got a chance to talk to you before last, right? Yes, that is correct, the year let's before. Introduce, let's introduce yourself and tell us what you do. I want you to look at the camera. I want people to know beautiful women come to the Diversity Aquatics. If you missed it, you missed out on all these beautiful women, too. My name is Morari Shillette. I am a mother of swimmers. I am a, I work with a club. I'm a team manager. I'm a team rep, a summer league year on league swimming. Um, and I have a program where we do nonprofit work to help uh, young children all the way to the ages of 18 and even adults to get in the water, not only learn how to swim, but swim competitively and perfect and improve their swimming abilities. Now you, your program is located where? In the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. Okay. People who are watching this now, and they want to get in touch with you. Is there an email address or anywhere they can go to find out more about your program, website, and so on? Absolutely. I am with Elite Rays Swim Club. Our um, website address is EliteRaysSwimClub.com, and our email address is EliteRaysSwim at gmail.com. Now, if I'm not mistaken, in your program, you're at the top, right? You're the boss. You're the head something, right? You're the head person, though. You're making this happen. Well, I do a lot of work. I know you got staff and people helping. We do. We have our head coach. We have a number of volunteer parents that help. Um, and I just kind of turn lots of wheels. Right, right. Okay. I said that to say that. Every time you come to the conferences, you bring that energy with you, that go-getter energy. I'm wondering, how, do, how did you first get involved in the aquatics field? And then what made you say, hey, I'm going next level. I'm going to form swim teams. I'm going to get in the community. We're going to make this happen. Um, the first, my first introduction to swim team was through my daughter's summer league um, pool. So, I, a very quick story, I was the chairperson of an auction at my daughter's school. We were raising funds for the school, and one of the things that was put up for auction that nobody purchased was a summer um, share membership for my local summer pool near my neighbor, in my neighborhood. We went to visit the pool, and um, lo and behold, the person that welcomed us uh, I didn't know it at the time, but was the head coach. Well, that head coach was Elvin Foreman, who is the head coach of the club that I am with, Elite Race Swim Club. And my daughters began swimming, and uh, as they started swimming, I just became involved because I think that it's important that when you're in a certain space that you give back to that community or that, that group that you're with. So I just started volunteering at swim meets and at the pool, primarily cheering swimmers because I love to cheer swimmers. And I just fell in love with the sport. I love the sport. Um, it is great for your health. It is great for a community. It is a life-saving skill, and I think it's one of the best sports and activities that young people and adults can do. Excellent. Now, you, race-wise, you are a mixture of a couple of things, right? And I remember you telling me that. And you represent the essence of diversity in aquatics. Race, gender, the whole, everything is wound up in you. So tell, tell everybody out there so they can understand the international flavor of all everything that's mixed up in you. 
absolutely. So um, obviously I'm a woman right. and you know, we women, we are considered a minority. In addition to that, I am Cuban. I was born in Cuba. My parents are Cuban and I come here. I'm also an immigrant because I came here as a young child. Um, on my father's background, it's Jamaican, English. On my mother's, it's um, Chinese and Spanish from Spain. Um, and I think somewhere in there, there's a little bit of indigenous um, folks as well. So there's just all sorts of, of a mix in there. Mm -hmm. your, your unique background, how does that help you and what you do in terms of diversity, talking to people, educating people, disarming people, showing the different side of what's happening in aquatics? Right. Uh, the other thing I, I failed to mention is that uh, as far as being Cuban, my mother is white Cuban and my father is black, was black Cuban. Um, so in terms of that diversity, I think it helps people um, it helps me actually it helps me to be able to relate to others so when I talk to moms and their daughters are of color and they have very curly hair um, they're concerned about what the chlorine is going to do to their daughters hair or there's even their sons I have two young daughters with lots of very long hair so I'm able to relate to them and talk to them about that because our hair is mixed um, it does take extra care but I'm able to talk about that when people talk about well you know hold on hold on hold on now uh, a lot of people are looking at this right now saying okay She's talking about hair. Give me some advice. Give them some advice now. Lots of coconut oil. <laughs> coconut oil, olive oil, always, um rinse your hair and your body actually with clear water from the showers at the pool before entering the chlorine water that's number one you protect your hair and your skin by washing with clear water first number two yes a lot of conditioning you know and the oils are very very good for the hair um, and rinsing off right away and washing off one thing that I've discovered is vitamin C crystals with water you make a solution you spray that on your hair and your body after swimming, it helps to repel that chlorine off of your skin and your hair. Any and particular type of hairstyle you might want to have if you know you're going to swim a lot, should you maybe consider having a natural hairdo for a while or something like that? Right. I mean, um, you know, my daughters and myself, we, our hair is naturally curly, so when it's wet, it's like this, but of course longer. Uh, we're able to blow dry our hair if we want to have that straight look, but I would recommend wearing your hair natural. Um, braids, okay, because what you want to do when you swim is obviously keep your hair out of your face, so my hair becomes very thin when it's wet, and I pull it back in a bun. Um, and I, but I think that braiding is is a really great option. My daughters like to braid their hair a lot when they're swimming. Okay. Uh, the I think I cut you off. Did you have something else you were about to say, and then I cut you off? Of the Oh, we were talking about just being able to relate to others. Um, so when we talk about some parents say, well, you know, black folks don't swim, okay? And I say, well, actually they do, because look at me, I am black and I swim. Other folks will say, well, you know, I'm too old to learn to swim. I actually didn't learn how to swim properly till two years ago, okay? So I tell them, no, no, look, I'm way into my 40s, you know, almost 50, and I just learned how to swim properly. Um, well, oh, it just takes up too much time. I'm not gonna do 4.30 a.m. practices. And it's like, everybody doesn't have to be a competitive swimmer. I love competitive swimming. But the most important thing is for folks to learn the skill, drowning prevention, um, water safety, learning how to swim. You don't have to become a competitive swimmer, but at least make sure that your children and those in your family and your community know the life-saving skill of how to swim and save their own life. The ABCs, folks, and all, after you learn the ABCs, other things may transpire, they may not transpire, but you have gotten what you basically need, the fundamentals of swimming. Thanks for joining us right here at the uh, convention. Thank you, Lee. Always great to see you. All right. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the uh, conversations with Lee Pitts. Uh, we can call these water conversations with Lee Pitts at the uh, Diversity Aquatics 15th. 2015 conference like I told you people they're coming in from all over being a part of this learning process networking process friendship building process and visualizing the future of what could happen we have a coach here from Coppin State right yes, sir. and he's uh, let's learn a little bit from him when I say coach a swim coach let's get your, your name in and, and actually what do you do uh, my name is Raheem Booth. I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. I work at Coppin State University. I'm the aquatics director, and I'm also the head swim coach for the Aqua Eagle Swim Club. Um, Coppin State is one of our practice venues. So. Look, man, we didn't know there were black aquatics directors. We didn't know there were black head swim team coaches. <laughs> do you get funny looks sometimes when people realize what you do? Yeah, it always goes with a lot of explanation about, oh, how'd you get involved, things like that. So it's always a good story to tell, a nice nice little icebreaker for folk, folks sometimes. So I enjoy it, love working with the youth and also being able to serve my community. 
Tell us how you first got started in the whole world of swimming. Uh, I was introduced to me as a summer kid, uh, one of the local, local wrecking Fox programs, uh, Patterson Fox Swim Pool um, in Baltimore, Maryland, and used to swim every day. Then one lifeguard and swim instructor said, hey, you want to join the swim team? So learn how to swim, join the swim team, and fell in love with it since, since then. At the time, you had no idea it would lead to a career now, and, and you're actually making a living doing what you love to do? No, it's a good thing, you know, I always tell people that my hobby has become my career, something that I love. Originally played football, but you know, you always got to have a lifestyle of what you um, love, what you do every day. So I'm glad, I'm grateful and thankful for that. This is my first time seeing you at the conference. This is our third when we had convention here in Lakeland, Florida. Next year we'll be uh, down in Fort Lauderdale area. Uh, the, uh, how are you enjoying it so far? I'm having an awesome time. I'm glad to know that there's other aquatic professionals out there in the world who are diverse and come from different backgrounds, and I'm learning a lot. I'm just great for this opportunity to meet other folks and professionals who are trying to make an impact in the sport of aquatics. Okay. Uh, the, uh, when you look so far in the first day and you think about, hey, I hadn't thought about something that way, or that was an interesting thing I learned there. You know, tell me about that moment so far when you say, hmm, this is really worth my while. Uh, actually, hearing you speak earlier today, I was like, it's kind of deja vu, like, you know, there's some of the things experiences about, oh, wow, I didn't know that someone else had experienced the same thing that I was going through. And kind of as a aquatic professional, being diverse or being African American, you think that you only have the same problems. Like, it's just you having that problem, that challenge that you're trying to go overcome. So hearing that other persons have different challenges or similar challenges and have actually had solutions to it and fixing it, working it out, I think that's the first takeaway I'm taking away today. I appreciate that. Um, next year, the conference is going to be uh, in July. We're going to have the information on the screen. But uh, tell people why it's important that they come out and participate in this great event next year. Uh, it's, it's, it's extremely important to come out because of uh, professional development, uh, networking, learning how to you know, take some best practices back to your facilities or back to your community and sharing with everybody else. Again, it's about being able to cast our net even larger amongst our communities and fellow um, aquatic professionals. So look forward to seeing you soon. Final question. Why is it important that in the field of swimming and water safety, uh, aquatic sports and everything else that we have diversity and we see people of all races, colors, creeds, sexes participate? Uh, just uh, living in America, living in the United States, it's the dream of all dreams. Anything is possible, just have to take a chance and have opportunity. And I think that's most important that we take away from this is that aquatics isn't just for one set group, it's for everybody. We all have opportunities to improve ourselves, be a part of something great. Who would you like to shout out? Uh, my wife and kids, um, Cop City University back in Baltimore, Maryland. Baltimore in the house, right down here in Florida. We'll be right back. We're sitting here with the incomparable, the undescribable, the indisputable leader of the band. <laughs> if you guys don't know, that comes from the cartoon Top Cat. He's Top Cat. <laughs> anyway, this is Dr. Bill. She has one of the most important, if not the most important job as it relates to diversity in aquatics and what she brings to the table. I am so motivated to see that we got somebody who can take the ball and run with it. Now, if you missed this conference again, I keep telling you, everybody who sits down here doing some interesting things that you didn't know were going on and you are not a part of the movement, you need to be here next year. Dr. Bill, first of all, introduce, tell us a little bit about your background and how you are tying that in to what we're doing here in Diversity Aquatics. Okay. Oh, thank you so much. So I, my name is Dr. Angela Beal, and I am actually the Director of Education and Research for Diversity in Aquatics. My history includes a swimming on the nationally acclaimed physical, uh, I mean, look, PDR, Department of Recreation, under um, Jim Ellis. I also have experience as a licensed training provider, water safety instructor trainer, um, and just a, a wonderful background in aquatics. I also am an academician. Um, I presently am a professor in the university sector and I wield my experience which um, I feel a responsibility to utilize to not only combat the drowning epidemic but also to gear the knowledge and, and develop the knowledge that Mr. Pitts, you, 
have have started and been been a pioneer in that has truly impacted me. I just showed up on the scene this year. I didn't even exist back in the day. I, I wasn't even around, folks. I just showed up out of nowhere. No, but the impact of really understanding the research which has been laid before us. It's my responsibility to try to actually compartmentalize and understand that and make sure our voice continues to be heard through here in diversity and aquatics. Now I got a chance uh, on a serious tip to show uh, myself at a young age back in the, early, in the late 80s before the movement in terms of drowning statistics were even known to the world. What was that like when you sitting there as a historian and see this, it's like, holy smoke. <laughs> you know, the funny thing is, it's almost as if history has repeated itself. Mm -hmm. And everything that um, was said by you at 29 years of age is actually the same conversation that we are, are having today and it, it truly is relevant. And when you talk about the history of that and the statistics, and the impact, it really makes us say, okay, what is going on? We have national uh, governing bodies of organizations in aquatics truly making efforts. That's what we believe, um, saying things. But as, as an organization, we are holding ourselves accountable with our own needs assessment to truly understand and know the information uh, about our history from Africa through the diaspora to where we are today and really the strength that we have. Um, I think as an organization being led by pioneers such as yourself, we are truly taking on the problem that everyone likes to coin it as in terms of African Americans, blacks and, and drowning and we're saying okay we understand that. We're even also helping you understand that we really have common sense knowledge as well as the book sense to to acknowledge that but we also want to be problem solvers with that and and that's truly our goal here at diversity and aquatics and and that's what we're really geared to now I, I, when you said book knowledge is one of the things that i noticed that's a common thread not only here at the conference because all of us bring other unique skills to the table of course i'm a television talk show host for crying out loud my background is swimming and i'm bringing my unique skill to the table you bringing your new unique skill to the table but what we see throughout the thread of people who swim is we see that generally they turn out to be solid productive citizens and if i'm not mistaken you can speak to that on college campuses on high school at high school in terms of athletic program, generally the swimmers have the highest grade point average. Yeah. Speak, speak to the logic behind that. What, what, why do you think that is the case? I think that's the case because of the discipline that it takes to actually become a swimmer and be active and the discipline behind that um, in terms of understanding movement and un in terms of understanding the importance of looking at swimming um, really as a life-saving skill and I think in the African-American community it life-saving takes on more than just one definition um, in terms of uh, aquatic involvement and learning how to swim as you know and have led the way it opens up uh, the opportunity to become a professional at the age of 16 to actually for some of us like myself to learn how to acquire occupational skills that allow you to get money, to get a job, to get to pay for school and schooling. And, and when you have that kind of value and discipline to learn to swim, whether it's competitive or not, but understand that the, how that life-saving value can not only save your life physically, with regard to if you are in a situation like you're speaking of about having common sense knowledge about what to do if you're in a Hurricane Katrina situation, mm -hmm. which is something that we have not forgotten, is, is really what, you know, having that knowledge can save your life that way, but also set examples to steps to become a professional such as yourself through being able to pay for school or actually have different occupational skill sets to allow that. And that discipline is really what turns people up, um, into good students and to good professionals and that and it truly is a youth development kind of process. Excellent. And we're capturing all of that here. Uh, before you go, um, what in the near future, not to give all the details, but something is going to come out of these professional uh, uh, diverse aquatics people in terms of something that can live on in history uh, as we start to document things. Talk about some of the plans for the future in terms of a book. 
Some of the plans for our future are actually an upcoming Diversity in Aquatics book, Volume 1, which really is going to be a monograph of the history of African Americans and minorities in aquatics, and really some self-told stories of experiences that truly will, will resound and, and send forth the voice that we have always existed. It is not something where we have not been present. And therefore, with that information, we hope to continue to tell the story, but always remember the future. And as, as you have done and do so el so eloquently, I mean, that truly, through through sharing our initiatives with International Water Safety Day, and, and really telling about uh, how, as professionals, we are really be, be, being held accountable for that information. The book, Truly Diversity in Aquatics, um, will start the beginning of that storytelling. Why is it that people should uh, take pride in telling their own story and that people should value hearing the story being told by the actual people who lived it? Absolutely. Uh, it's important because when you, we talk about saving our voice, and truly having our voices be heard. Um, oftentimes commercialism can um, dilute the true impact and essence of a situation. And, and it's important that we own our story and we tell our story and we tell it correctly. And through diversity and aquatics, through your leadership, through Sean's leadership, um, we have that responsibility to gain and capture that knowledge that is there and make sure that we disperse it and, and share that information with the world. Well, Dr. Bill, thanks for joining us here on Conversations, Water Conversations on Leapers Live. At the conf convention here in Lake Worth, Florida, your uh, addition and your knowledge and what you bring to our uh, uh, organization is invaluable. Keep up the good work. Thank you very much. We'll be right back with some youths who are here. Right back. There you go. <laughs> here with Richard T. Butler. Many of you have seen Richard uh, in these documentaries over the over the years. Now he's becoming a staple. He shows up ready on time. Richard T. Butler. He's our rowing guy. Rowing. And uh, look. At these uh, diversity aquatics conferences, as you guys have seen, all types of disciplines are coming through here. And I think this weekend at the conference, we're going to actually get a chance to do some rowing demonstration. This guy is committed. He's dedicated. We're just so glad to have him be a part of diversity aquatics. Uh, Richard, what are some of the messages that you're taking around the world uh, from your experiences at these conferences? So, Lee, first off, I'm so glad to be able to attend again. It's one of the highlights out of all the conventions I get to go to. This one is culturally the right one for me because I get to be in a room with people who speak my language, who know where I've been, and uh, we can get started with business because we don't have to do the backstory. So I'm really glad to be here. Uh, when I, I'm the inclusion manager for U.S. Roaring, and what that means is that I actually try to create awareness and recruit uh, traditionally underrepresented youth and adults who would not be a rower. So being at the Diversity and Aquatics Convention, A, I get to share that message, what we're doing across the nation, which is recruiting kids to learn about rowing. Maybe one of them one day will be an Olympic rower, but that's not the most important piece. The most important piece is that they have the confidence to be on water. Uh, the second thing that I'm getting from this, that it continues to be reiterated to me that without confidence on water, then there, there's many limitations that our kids will, will have. Many people don't know this. If you can't swim, you cannot row. So this is a peanut butter and jelly match made in heavy. This is gravy and potatoes. We have to be together. So being at the diversity and um, diversity uh, and aquatics convention get me to sit down and talk strategy with some of my counterparts of the other national governing bodies of sports such as USA Swimming. Uh, we get together, we come up with plans for the year. Uh, that, so, so far, so good. Why should people come out next year if they're watching this right now and they're considering coming out next year to the convention in July? Why should they come out? Great question. The, the main reason that I think people should come out is first you need to understand that when I sit around a table with the board of directors and an advisory board of diversity and aquatics, they have something that we are striving for on a national level for national governing bodies and Olympic sports, to have a very diverse and inclusive board. What the diversity and aquatics group did, well they started from the best 
of minorities representing aquatic sports and then spread it outwards. Normally organizations start with um, uh, just uh, traditional white board members and then try to find a minority member to be on the board. Well, this is different with diversity in aquatics. So diversity in aquatics is, is for real with the mission. What people can expect is when you come to the camp in July, uh, uh, in July in 2015, your coaches, your leaders will look exactly like the children and the adults that we're trying to reach. And it's called diversity in aquatics for a reason. And, and so when you show up on the pool deck or you show up to learn how to row or to hear some of the mentors speak, you're going to be inspired that most of these adults who are leading these sessions are just like or were and are just like your kids. And why is that important? I'll, I'll tell you what, that, that is so important because modeling is important. Uh, I was just telling us, sharing a story just now. I, I travel around the country and my CEO will say, uh, will you, we're going to bring some of our Olympians in. Will you bring some of the kids from your America Rose program so they can meet the Olympians? And we get to that site to meet the Olympians and all of the kids had never met me before come up to me. Why? Because I look like them. I become the celebrity or that role model or mentor beyond the Olympians. And when I tell them it's okay then to meet the Olympians, they go, well, Mr. Butler says okay to meet the Olympians. And so there's a lot of influence when you can, can be culturally competent with your audience. There are going to be thousands of people who will see this on, on the social media, on television. Uh, and they're saying, okay, he keeps saying rowing, rowing. Is that the thing where I see like eight people or two people on a lake? I mean, Sesame Street to them, to what is rowing and what are some of the benefits to, of becoming a rower? That's a great question, Lee, and it's really interesting. One day I was talking to a bunch of uh, young men that, were in pri that are imprisoned in uh, Detroit, and I said, raise your hand if you know what rowing is. And these are high school age boys sure they're incarcerated no one raised their hand finally a young man brave enough to step forward says sir do you mean curling and so curling as you know is a sport that you play on ice and so I knew right then and there I have a problem with this awareness of the sport of rowing rowing is one of the most dynamic sports that anyone could ever participate in it is the ultimate team sport because you have eight men or women in a boat with a ninth person steering the boat and you have to put your oar handle in the water at the exact same time at the exact same over the exact same pressure the benefits of rowing is beyond the health and fitness benefits beyond combating childhood obesity one of the benefits of rowing and i share this all the time is that there are college scholarships for young ladies title nine basically has said that you have to have sports equity Rowing requires 40 to 60 athletes. There are at least 20 college scholarships a year available for young ladies to row. If I can get a young lady two years of experience of rowing and she is decent at it and her academics are up to par, I can pretty much open doors to not only Division three colleges, but Division one, two, II, and three. And if the Ivy Leagues like her, although they don't have scholarships, they're going to go after her also. Amazing. Now, you said there are at least 20 scholarships available. You saying per school that has that program? Correct. So the example would be, and don't quote me here, if there's 168 colleges that have rowing programs, uh, 168 of them would have 20 rowing scholarships for young ladies. Now here's the trick. Because it's only 20, what the coaches will do is give 10 full scholarships and then split 10 to bring in another 20. So you could be decent and get a partial scholarship and then they'll help you find a financial package or you could be great and you get a full scholarship. Uh, final question, how can people in television land, social media land, how can they just get in touch with you for more information, is there a website, is there an email address, and say, hey, this sounds pretty interesting. And on top of that, do you have to be an experienced rower right now to get started? I guess I need to change that question. What's a good age? When can you get started? If you're like 
Like if somebody's 12 years old right now, is it too late? No, here's the beauty. That's a, that's a great question, Lee. And the beauty of rowing is that you can't start until middle school. So we get young people who may have never played a sport before or figured out that they really stink at basketball and they're sitting around looking for the next sport. They don't get started until they are in middle school. So we're talking eighth to ninth grade. So that, that particular child is not burned out from their sport because we start most sports when they're six years old, seven years old. So that's one thing. Uh, but you, one of the entry points that we just created is we do indoor rowing all across the country. So instead of having to find a rowing program on the water, you now can do indoor rowing within the city of LA, have a program in Chicago, have a program in Seattle. But if you want to know more, and I'm going to call everyone to the carpet this time, because no one called me or emailed me the last time we did this, I'm looking for emails and I'm looking for phone calls. You can reach me at richard at usrowing.org, or I'm going to give you my phone number, and I will take your call, 412-498-9017. I want to hear from you. I want to answer your questions, and I want you to become a rower. Hey, Richard, last year we didn't get your contact information, so that's why I didn't, that's call why I didn't get a call. That's why I didn't get a call. <laughs> okay, hit Richard up, be educated. All y'all academia, uh, academic people out there, sports coaches, physical education coaches, in the schools, what have we, scholarship money is just sitting out there waiting to be gotten, and this guy wants to get it to you. He's, uh, he's, he's personable. We're so glad to have him as a part of our organization, and uh, he contributes such a great deal. Richard, you're gonna actually, we're going to actually do some rowing this weekend, right? We're going to do some indoor rowing this weekend just to give it a little taste of what the Olympians and the high schoolers have to go to to become an on-water rower. It's all happening right here on Waters Conversation with Lee Pitts at the Diversity Aquatics 2015 Convention. We'll be right back. All right. Okay. Folk, you know I cover these aquatics, uh, diversity aquatics conferences every year. My favorite interview of all is when I get to talk to Charlie Lumpkin. Now, one of the reasons I like to talk to Charlie Lumpkin, this gentleman, is because I like to get him on tape as a historic figure. The first time I met Charlie Lumpkin was about three years ago. You won't meet a nicer person, but he's so humble. This guy, was, I would say, is one of the most successful black springboard divers in the history of America. And he did that back in the 60s. And we still haven't had a springboard diver to rise to such heights as what, what we know about Charlie. We're going to learn more about why don't we see black people diving off those diving boards in these Olympic games, the Pan Am games, all these types of games. The diving folk, the springboard, the platform, and all that. And we know the sisters and the brothers could do that. This is the only place that you're going to get all of these people with these diverse backgrounds. I'm going to keep Charlie focused on my favorite sport that first got me into swimming is when I saw those cats in the neighborhood diving off those maybe three feet, four feet diving boards at the local swimming pool, standing at the gate as a kid, I said, I got to learn how to go on one of those diving boards. And I certainly eventually went off the diving board. So when I saw Charlie at the conference, I bow down to the great. Charlie Lumpkin, the springboard extraordinaire. Charlie, first and foremost, welcome to Waters, a conversation with Lee Pitts at the Diversity Aquatics Conference. How do you feel being back again this year, bro? Uh, giving honor to God, Lee, it's always a pleasure uh, doing conversations and interviews and breaking bread with you, my brother. All right. if Charlie, now, we got, I got a chance to come down there to Key Largo, saw you with uh, Classroom Under the Water, is that correct? Classroom Under the Sea. Classroom Under the Sea. You played an integral part in that historic event. What was that like for you to be a part of such a, a magnificent moment where the Aquanauts went underwater, stayed underwater for how many hours and days and talk about that? 73 days. Uh, it was the most educational experience I've ever been part of to bring so many facets of the sea together. And I helped raise thousands of dollars for the program. And I also helped bring a couple of groups down. And 
for me, it was the culmination of years of studying on about living underwater and what the purpose of living underwater might be in terms of nuclear war. And maybe we'll live underwater to survive weapons of mass destruction. Now, you've seen it take on a lot of causes, and when you get involved with those causes, you put your whole body into it. You really study up on it, become obsessed with it, do everything you can to make it come to reality. And one of the causes that's one of your dominating thoughts is always the next generation, educating the youth, supporting the youth. One of the things you said here in the conference that I would never forget is, let's encourage the youth instead of having youth saying that teacher or that person said I would never succeed. Talk about that. Uh, that was Biggie Smalls that said, this is for all the teachers that said I wouldn't be anything. And it taught me as a teacher to never, ever, ever say that to a student. And as much as I can to give positive feedback. Uh, this is one of the arenas that bring back a whole lot of inf uh, memories uh, for me and I've had the opportunity to teach thousands of students. But you mentioned something earlier today and that was how when you were in line waiting trying to get a job as a kid you was there praying. And we have lost so much influence from faith in our lives as a community. And if, it, if I could do anything to install anything into our community and other communities in the world, it would be to really develop your faith. And that encourages me to give to other folks, to motivate myself. It's one thing when someone asks you to do things. It's another when God asks you to do something. Now, the things that I had done along the way in terms of you know, developing all of these swim skills, all of that was put in place by God. So when the moment came, when things that I learned in the past that I didn't know would benefit me in the future, all that's a part of faith and blessing that paid off when I was able to be the only person to step forward. Is that the way you saw it? I mean, you followed that story when I was telling it? A absolutely. I could relate to that. But we must constantly relate to not just the younger generation, but to all generations. That's how we made it. That's just a fact, especially in aquatics when we were only black folks involved in things. There had to be a divine hand on us for us to be right here now. God gave us grace. We did something with it. You seem to be able to talk about race to all nationalities. You talk about key things that need to be addressed. And whites, Hispanics, blacks, Everybody seemed to listen to you and not see you as the black guy with a chip on his shoulder. How are you able to win friends, build consensus, influence people, and get people working in the same direction? Well, I read that book, too, How to Win Friends and Influence People, Dale Carnegie. He ain't slipping anything by Charlie. It's from a book. But uh, my first friend, when I was about five years old, was a white kid. And my neighborhood was integrated. All the whites lived on one side of the street. All the blacks lived on the other. And my mother was a, a real strong person of faith. And a white guy that was in tattered clothes came to our door one day and knocked on the door. And lady said, and he said, Les, can you give me something? And I told my mom, get that bum out of here. Get him. She said, we're going to feed him because he's hungry. Mm -hmm. And that was the basis for my whole life dealing with people, especially people that aren't my color. It's about love in your heart. And my mom gave me that love for humanity that had just carried over all of my life. Now, Charlie, the um, springboard diving, I'm getting to springboard diving. I'm staying focused there right now. As a curious kid, the curious kid who's curious about how Charlie got to do something that I wish I had been exposed to. Just imagine if Charlie had met me as a kid and I wanted to be a springboard diver. Charlie is a role model. He could have passed those skills down from generation to generation, and I may have become a springboard diver. Charlie, uh, first of all, tell our TV audience, and I know you don't like to brag on yourself, but talk about some of your major accomplishments as a springboard diver in America. Well, just as you said, I watch people dive. And where I practice at, Kelly Pool on the East Coast was built by the Kelly family, where Grace Kelly is the, the sister. Hold on, hold on now. People watching this all over the country, you say on the East Coast, be more specific. In Philadelphia. Uh, the Kelly family was from Philadelphia, and they built a major swimming pool that was in a white neighborhood 
and all the white people moved out. What year are we talking about? We're talking about in the 60s. So I inherited that. And they had all the major national championships on the East Coast there. Wide World of Sports, the 76 national champions. And I used to just sit on the side like you. And I said, oh my God, if I could ever learn to do that. I fell in love with the sport. Mm -hmm. And from there, I just got the opportunity. They were looking for black kids. They were looking for talent. In my area, they was looking for any color talent. And I just stuck with it because I loved it. Now, you look like you might be about 6'3", six, 6'4". Six, right. So you were a tall, rangy, elegant, which is a beautiful sight to see on the springboard. Now, would your height be to your advantage or your disadvantage in diving, springboard, or platform diving? <laughs> I'm 6'2". My training partner, I'm going to give his name his name, Robbie Craig. Robbie Craig dove with Greg Laganus. Robbie Craig was six foot three. He finished six in the Olympics in Montreal. Now, Robbie Craig was black as well? No, Robbie Craig was white. Okay. Now, when you were uh, on your trajectory to maybe become an Olympian, you got stopped in your diving process to go to the military, then you came back and picked it back up? Right, and I went to South Carolina State University. Morgan State had Ron Cloud, he was a diver. I dove in the national championship with him. And a couple of other black schools had a couple of people that were swimming in the national championship at Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, Andrew Brown, he was a sprinter. He swam 21-7 in high school. So Morehouse had one of the top swimming programs. South Carolina State ended up being a little bit better. Talk to those people out there who are trying to make a difference in terms of bringing more diversity into springboard diving, platform diving tap into all the resources we have in America so that we could always put our best uh, athletes forward. What would you recommend to those people on how you can tap into an untapped resource starting from ground up, brick by brick, in the inner city and get some of these black boys and girls into diving? Some of the people from, play, uh, from Diversity and Aquatics, I took to a diving meet. I hadn't been to a diving meet in 20 years just to watch and we were amazed that no black kids were out there but I went on the website the US diving just like they have a US swimming website and I started looking at where the teams are located across the country so you have to go on that site look where the teams are and then you have to contact one of the teams if you want to dive and be available I'm going to start taking kids to watch diving practices it is one of the most beautiful things and you know we watch it on television all the time and we just in kind of become so uh, accustomed to not seeing any color diving but one of the interesting thing is one of the greatest divers in the history of diving in the world was actually a person of color Charlie Lumpton got to meet him personally knew him talk about that great diver call his name and let people know he was uh, he was a person of color uh, Greg Laganis was Samoan and he was taught by Dr. Sammy Lee which was he was from Korea and they saw him at an early age he actually moved in with Dr. Sammy Lee. Greg Laganis was adopted. And throughout his career, he got better and better and better. In diving, they have what they call a diving table. You can only do the dives that are on this list. He got so good, they had to change the list. And he's multi-Olympian, and most of his friends and colleagues said if he wasn't gay at the time that he was, that he would have been a millionaire. And he had a book signing in Philadelphia once and I didn't go. One of the most ashamed things in my life was not attending that because I thought people might have thought I was gay. And so you shared with us today that, uh, and I didn't know that, that you know, there was a stigma that divers, just like you might see male models of people think that they're gay, that, that, that was a thing that ran, runs through a diving circuit that people think they're gay? Not that heavy. Dancing? When I was back then, yeah, if you were in a dance group in college, I probably would have been a dancer if it wasn't for the stigma, you know, because I, I used to love to dance. But we've come a long way. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. And I'm proud of the fact that our country was changing in the right way as far as gay rights and stuff. Charlie, talk to our TV audience. Tell them what they should do, why they should come next year in July to the 2016 uh, Diversity Aquatics convention well I asked a question today on what was the uh, doomsday clock the doomsday clock represents 
through technology, when in terms of time, minutes, the world is going to end. Nobody but one person even wanted to try that. And the two things are nuclear weapons and global warming. And they affect us in our area a whole bunch. But learning occurs in direct proportion that it touches a felt need. So nobody here except one person felt that he was going to need to know that. So we have to establish a need to know. Why should I come and learn this? I invested money, thousands of dollars, to put the name of diversity in aquatics out because the drowning rate is so high. We're losing lives. We're losing the ability to go into other sports. It was critically important. Now I'm at the other end of the totem pole on if we don't solve the nuclear problem, it's like being on the ship with the, on the Titanic fighting for deck space. So there is a priority that we have to follow. See, Charlie Lumpkin is like Louis Farrakhan. He has all this information in his head. You start off with him on diving, and next thing you know, you're talking about nuclear weapons, global warming, Greenpeace, all this stuff wound up in this guy. The great. Because where you were at, Classroom Under the Sea, is about surviving nuclear uh, weapons. That's why I invested so much time and money in learning that. But if you don't learn how to swim, you can't learn how to scuba dive, you're not going to survive that. I want my people to have a chance to survive. That's great. And Charlie Lumpkin mentioned Classroom Under the Sea. If you're watching this, go on YouTube, put in Charlie Lumpkin. That's L-U-M-P-K-I-N, Classroom Under the Sea on Lee Pitts Live. You'll see the interview that I had to do with this pioneer uh, as he participated in the classroom under the sea, which, are his, which, are hit, which was a historic event as well. So, and Lee, I'd like to say thank you for the work that you have done. And I planted a little seed into your organization <laughs> because I believe in what you're doing, man. And God bless you. It's Charlie Lumpkin, folk. I'm here with history. I'm going to show this to the kids and to those grandkids and the grandkids and the grandkids. Charlie Lumpkin, one of the great uh, springboard platform divers of color in the history of America. We'll be right back. You know, I struck. Oh, man. <laughs> All you people out there in television land say, wait, Lee Pitts has the coolest job. Look. How in my lifetime would I ever be around all of this brain trust of people of different races and colors who actually deal in swimming and other water related sports? And the interesting thing about it is as you move around in here, we find all these people who do one thing, but they do other things that are even more successful at. Like this gentleman right here, Arthur Lopez, he's a renowned attorney, participated in the civil rights, met Rosa Parks sitting here right next to us, and he's been involved in aquatics for many years, influencing particularly kids, Latino kids, uh, in the Northeast, right, uh, Arthur? Okay, and then over here, we got a head swim team coach, a speed guy, and looks, uh, and you probably were uh, uh, a swimmer yourself, right? A right. little bit before, yes. Okay, right. now let me, don't, you guys don't act like I know who you are. I gotta ask you certain questions for TV purposes, for documentary purpose. All right, uh, Arthur, tell us who you are. Right now, I'm a clinical professor of business law and ethics at Kelly School of Business, Indiana University, Bloomington. And I'm also had, I retired last year from the federal government with 23 years as an attorney, director of civil rights, worked for the Office of Government Ethics, and many other things in social justice issues. Um, so you were able to bring that legal mind to us, settle us down every time in the meeting, come in with that slot logic, keep everything on track, and talk about the Show me the money. All right, <laughs> and talk about this right here, talk about this one program that you used to uh, direct that I saw on video and just outstanding. I ran a group called Nadar Pro Vida, I mean Swim for Life. And what it was was a, a group of kids and families in Northern Virginia. And with the help of all of you, I mean, we were able to bring and bring families together for the first time. And it was unlike most experiences where it was both learn to swim and transitioning immediately if they chose to, to competitive swimming or life-saving or WSI or other things. Now, one of the things you said, and I'm going to be right over here, you know, I'm coming back. You said that you saw swimming as the hook the bait to get in front of people, get the kids 
in front of you and your other director to be able to talk to them about other life things that were going to benefit them, them in life. Why, why do you think swimming is such a hook to young kids to get them get their attention? See, everybody always says that I ran an aquatics program. Aquatics, it could have been anything. It was a vehicle for assimilation, for a success. Because if you could show that a child could put their head in the water, that they could swim, that they could do other things achieve, they can achieve in the classroom. They can achieve in life. And that was the whole goal. That's right. Outstanding program. Tell us about what you're doing and uh, where you're physically located. I want people to understand that everybody here in Florida is f not from Florida. Uh, my name is John Yearwood. I am from uh, metropolitan region. I'm from New York. Uh, I'm currently the head coach of the White Plains YWCA MIDI swim team. Uh, I'm also the head coach of the College of New Rochelle uh, girls swim team. Uh, I sit on the board for Metropolitan Swimming. I'm the diversity chair and I'm also the finance chair. Uh, other positions that I've served, I've served six years as the age group chair and I've just been around and everything that we've got, diversity and... So you're saying that there are head swim team coach, head aquatics people who are African American and Hispanic, that actually exists in America? It exists, you know, it, it may not be something that people pay attention to all the time, but we're out there, you know, we do exist, we do get the job done the same way as anybody else. Mm -hmm. The, uh, what, what, what did you get from attending this conference? What have you learned so far? your first year coming to this conference and do you see yourself coming in the future? Um, being my first year at this actual conference, the best part is being able to sit around with experts who are involved in other aspects of aquatics and just coming together and brainstorming about things that we've done and you know some of the perils that we've faced and, and try to figure out how to get better and how to tighten things up. And yes, I will be back next year. Uh, I will be running the, the swim camp next year for the 2016 Diversity in Aquatic Swim Camp. All right, please. Uh, I haven't mentioned the date, if you can remember right. I know it's in July, like late July. Uh, the date for the camp is going to be July 25th through the 31st. Okay, and they can just go to that website on the screen for more details on that. And there will be a uh, swim meet as well as some learning swim things going on and learning swim for adults. So, uh, just, just talk summarize it for us. Uh, right now we're going to focus on three tracks. We're going to have an adult learn to swim track, we're going to have a youth learn to swim track, and we're going to have a competitive swim camp for uh, okay. swimmers to come out. And that will be at Nova Southeastern University right down here in the Fort Lauderdale area. Uh, Arthur, the, uh, when you're sitting here in these conferences, you, you, you've seen it all, man. I mean, you're like the, you know, you, you're the owl sitting up on the hill. You've seen it all, heard it all. Do you still learn something when you come to these conferences? You remember the Advisory Council for uh, Diversity Aquatics? Uh, tell me, how do you approach this? How, how do you approach your process? It's very selfishly. You know, what I try to tell young folks when they're out there volunteering, just like with this, this is the time to recharge. You hear the stories, you see the legacy, you see the younger people who are excited and want to do something, carry on the banner to go further and do more things and affect things. And that's selfish because that recharges me. That helps me go back and say, hey, I can do some more. You know, because we all sit there and say, I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm not tired. I am excited, and that's what I get from here is a recharge. Uh, I don't, I don't know if you follow the state of uh, particularly Latinos, Hispanics, as it relates to swimming. But if you had to summarize, what's the state of affairs? Are we we, get, we seeing more Hispanics, more Latin? Uh, I think it's all the same thing, but I'm screwing it up. Uh, involved in aquatics is it growing uh, is it stagnant what, what are you hearing and seeing no, it's not growing it's it's got the same problems we've always had people are not going forward they're not going for and and look right now what's in the news talking about drones yesterday talking about drones at the border in order to protect from those mexicans who are doing all these terrible things they say you know, they're not talking about swimming, they're not talking about educating our youth, they're not talking... And then Ben Carson says he wants the drones to be militarized so he can shoot the aliens. So, listen, you know, think now this is not even, you know, you always hear about uh, blacks and others and other minorities. Some I was telling that to Dr. Bill when she said, well, yeah, you know, that's a, a black issue too. I go, no, 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 no. This is one, this, this is Mexicans and others. They want to shoot us. And we're talking about swimming. But it's still important. We, so many of us are talking about anchor babies, but anchor babies, that was my dad. You know, my dad and my mom came here and they had me. 
and they were not citizens, and we became a part. He became a citizen of World War II after being on a PT boat and fighting in World War II. And what most people don't know is that up until 1992, they were deporting people who fought for our country by the name of Velasquez and Martinez. And these were all folks who fought for our country because they weren't citizens. No, when you talk about state of aquatics, you're talking about state of achievement. No, we're not there yet. But we will be. We will be. See, every time we bring these aquatics slash brilliant minds to the camera, we get additional information, we get a different perspective, we get more insight, world affairs. We're not just not swim people. We have a wide variety of opinions and thoughts about things. And that's why people like Arthur Lopez are so valuable to what we do and also contribute to the vaster knowledge, more knowledge into the cultural experience that we need to add to the body of knowledge. Arthur Lopez is the man. You to interpret, and you do a great job of it. So, gentlemen, it's been a pleasure having you both here join us on Waters Conversations with Lee Pitts at Diversity Aquatics 2015 Conference. We're gonna go back and learn some more information. We're getting ready to talk about rowing, and then we're gonna come back and talk to some more people. You guys, wave bye-bye. Hi, Mom. <laughs> it's just happened. Peace out. Welcome back to uh, Diversity in Aquatics uh, 20, uh, 2015 uh, Diversity uh, uh, Conference Convention. We want to use that word convention. I think Sean said it sounds bigger, so convention. Anyway, I'm Lee Pitts. Of course, uh, we're taking you through a magnificent day here. We're on break right now, so every time we get a break, I try to squeeze in some interviews for the sake of history. We have a, a young lady here who lives in the area. She's a part of Black Girl Swim. And let's get your full name and what else are you doing uh, in the water? Okay. Well, hi, Lee. I'm Stephanie Fiddler. And um, I became acquainted with DAP through a swim clinic that Black Girls Run uh, got involved with, with DAP. And Thaddeus Gamry was the uh, swimming coach. And, uh, and now I've fallen in love with the water. I just finished my third triathlon last week after having a fear, I can't even describe to you, a fear of deep water all my life. So Excellent. Now, you swam in open water in the triathlon? Tell us about that. Well, it was an uh, open water in uh, Key Biscayne, so right here in South Florida. Uh, quarter mile swim. All right, a little bit of current, and, um, and I was able to get through it. I was probably one of the last people out the water, but for me, that was a huge triumph because I used to be scared of the deep end of a pool, much less an open water, so. You're the type of person I need to be talking to right here at the uh, Diversity and Aquatics Conference. The, okay, I said black girls swim. I know I've heard that somewhere. Tell us, there's black girls run who also swim as well. Some of you who are in the organization, Enlighten our public. Well, Black Girls Run is a national organization to get uh, women out and exercising. And even though it's called Black Girls Run, it's open to all women. Um, and it's a nationwide organization where women run together for safety and encouragement and bonding. But some of the women in Black Girls Run wanted to learn to swim um, because swimming is great cross training for running. And so they formed a partnership with DAP to get some of these ladies swimming with the thought that maybe down the road they would do a triathlon. Black Girls Swim is something completely different, and um, so they're trying to get something like that going as well, but Black Girls Run is the group that I was with. Now, when you first heard of the whole idea of you possibly doing a triathlon, the first time you heard it, did you go, I know I'm never going to do that, I, but I'll, you know, I'll just go through the paces right now. And then it actually became a reality. Tell me about the realization of it and how you first heard the, the thought of doing a triathlon. Well, I was a runner and I was training for a marathon. And I actually, it was the Boston Marathon bombing, that tragedy. I was training for the New York City Marathon and I had this horrible thought that, you know, in New York Marathon, you run across all these bridges. And I was talking to my coworker and I actually said to him, wow, you know, we, you run by so much water with New York. And I always said I wanted to learn to swim. And, I, and he said, well, why don't you do a triathlon? Because that will force you to learn to swim well enough, the training for that. And that will give you something to focus on instead of your fear of the water. So I decided that I wanted to learn to do it. And as God would have it, four or five months later, Black Girls Run was doing this partnership with Thaddeus. And I said, okay, well, I'm training for my marathon, but I'll come to the clinic as my cross training. Now, and learn to swim. 
day. Now, as you're sitting here at the conference, what are some things you are learning or taking away from the conference already? Well, I have to say that I'm really inspired by all these aquatic professionals because I'm not an aquatic professional. Uh, and just how much there is an issue in this country that I didn't know of so many people who can't swim and all of the drowning statistics that I was not aware of. Um, I also was not aware of all the different types of sports that involves the aquatics and how many job opportunities there are and just how many things that learning to swim can introduce you to and change your life about. So that's been eye-opening for me. Now, uh, when you say from this country, I, I hear a West Indian accent here slowly, and I want people who are watching this all around the world to understand that this conference is drawing people from all over the world, and you being from the Caribbean, what part of the Caribbean are you from? Born and raised in Jamaica. Okay, and uh, the in Jamaica is the a culture of swimming in water different from what you see here in America as it relates to black people, but everybody in Jamaica is pretty much black. Well, he, there are some similarities and some differences. So surprisingly, even for a Caribbean country, there are a lot of people who don't swim. Um, but the difference is culturally, the water is a very big part of our life. So going to the beach on a Sunday is a very big part of their life. You know, in the African-American community, going to the park, having a cookout in the Caribbean is going to the beach and eating fish. But you will see mothers telling their kids, don't go past where you can stand up. Don't go where I can't see you. So you have this contradiction where water is a big part of their life, but so many people don't know how to swim. That's great. Well, I'm so proud of you. You did the, you say you did three triathlon? Wow. Woo. Uh, keep up the good work, and uh, thanks for coming out and supporting us here at the uh, Diversion Aquatics Conference. All right, thank you. It's my pleasure. Okay, we'll be back right back with the world-famous Thaddeus. Welcome back to the Diversity Aquatics Conference. Behind us, we're in intermission, and every time we go into intermission, we have all of these people just get together like little cliques and start sharing information and trying to get it all in at the conference. One of the preeminent persons who's made this conference a success, not only this year, but last year, and you heard his name numerous times when people have come up here for interviews, has been Thaddeus. So this, this is Thaddeus right here. For history's sake, Thaddeus is the uh, chairman of the uh, councils, uh, and there's several councils. So let's get right to it. Thaddeus, first of all, describe, well, welcome to, welcome to Le Waters Leapitz Live, Con Leapitz Conversation at the conference. <laughs> uh, thank you, Lee. Pleasure to be here. What, um, ex explain your role in diversity in aquatics. As the Aquatic Council Chair, I get the privilege and the pleasure of being the coordinator of all the various aquatic councils which covers scuba diving, rowing, competitive swimming, triathlon, as well as uh, Caribbean Council and we have also a Veterans Council. So I'm involved with all of them. So I get to participate in all those activities as well as help organize and, and, and coordinate different programs that we're involved with. Now, how do you like it? I mean, what, how, how, do, how do you stay in, in, on top of all of those different silos that are taking place and how do you like it? Well, I, I, I love it because it's actually expanded my knowledge and my awareness of aquatics in a way that had never happened happened before it didn't exist for me especially I've learned from people like you and learned about the deep the depth of history in aquatics for black people that I didn't know about before uh, so what makes it satisfying rewarding even though it's hard work or sometimes it uh, keeps me very busy is that it's rewarding work It's rewarding work knowing about a collection of people out there that have been doing a good job and now we're all coming together to do a better job and make a, a stronger impact because we're united so um, I also get to practice and do uh, scuba diving, and so that part of it is fun. Excellent. Now, and, a, and, a, and diversity of aquatics is not only about uh, racial diversity, but it's also about water, aquatic activity, diversity. Tell our TV audience some of the types of diversity, diverse things that people can participate in in the water that they may, never, may not have even thought about. Well, we've done... Uh, what's called um, a splash and dash clinic where we do uh, swimming and we do running where we actually run on land or and or run in the water which we call deep water running uh, triathlons which is swim bike and run 
open water swims, which actually Stephanie mentioned that she had done three triathlons, but she actually had done two open water swims, which is exclusively just a swim, but in the ocean or in a bay. And we did swim Miami. Um, you can also rowing, which is a competitive rowing, um, is another sport or aquatic activity. Paddle boarding, uh, surfing, scuba, scuba diving. Uh, scuba diving for different reasons. Scuba diving for science and ocean, uh, oceanographic reasons. Uh, restoring the reefs. Scuba diving for archaeological reasons. Actually searching for wrecks and doing historical history. As a matter of fact, there's some slave ships off of uh, the coast of Florida that have been uh, researched. Um, the Henrietta Maria, I know, is off the coast as well. Key, uh, coast of Key West. Henrietta Maria, by the way, folks. It's a sunken slave ship that uh, I got a chance to dive to many years ago. Uh, they uh, discovered by, uh, I forget the name of the group down there in Key West. Go ahead. Yes. And, um, and some of the other activities that we have done. Uh, did I say paddle boarding already? Yeah, yeah I said paddle boarding. Um, and what we also do, and we use the water for, for fitness and recovery in a way such as deep water running, where if you have an injury, uh, you have a, a condition that maybe limits you from running on land, you can run in the water. Um, it's also tr it's serious run training as well. Uh, it was actually started uh, for pro and elite level, level athletes. Um, and now we have adapted it for helping people learn to swim as well as train multi-sport. Excellent. Let's go big picture now. Talk about um, 2016. Uh, why people should get up off their fannies, go to the website, find out in more information about it, and come down here to the Fort Lauderdale area and be a part of what's going to be happening in 2016 and go ahead and give that date. Sure. Uh, August 25th through August 23rd here in Broward County, Florida at Nova Southeastern University. We're planning to host our fourth annual convention and a swimming and multi-aquatic sport camp. Swimming may be the main focus of the aquatic uh, camp, which includes learn to swim as, sw as well as competitive swimming. But we also will introduce the participants, youth and adult, by the way. So it's adult learn to swim and youth learn to swim. We will also int introduce the participants to uh, additional aquatic sports like water polo. And like I mentioned, deep water running, triathlon, rowing. Uh, as well as maybe even going on an excursion to go paddle boarding and definitely so, some scuba diving as well because we have a scuba council and we've already actually, that's part of what we've already provided for some, some youth and adults to give them the first underwater experience of their life and they absolutely love it. So it's, it's going to be a complete uh, convention where you have, and camp where you have physical participation in, in skills and, and aquatic activities, as well as history from uh, distinguished aquatic historians like yourself, Lee, as well as Ken Rowland, who's a local uh, uh, ex accomplished aquatic professional who's got deep history here in South Florida with swimming competitively and water safety. Um, we're going to have, um, it, you, you're going to be able to stay on campus at a beautiful uh, campus. Uh, Nova Southeastern. Nova Southeastern University, so there will be uh, amazing accommodations as well as meals included. So next convention will be a complete package where you will have uh, housing, meals, and aquatic activities as well as meetings going on. But uh, the first part will be more focused on the camp. The tail end of that week will be more convention with meetings, but still other activities. Uh, go to that website that you see on the screen. That website is going to take you to all of the details about next year's conference so start planning it now plan to bring the children down to compete it's just going to be a great event uh you're very passionate about what you do tell us how wh why are you so passionate about uh just everything that you've been doing well i've used um the sport of swimming itself and triathlon and being in the water as a, a, a recreation as a social it helped me meet new friends and and make new bonds as well as professionally it is a, it's a source of income for me it's actually a lifestyle so it's a lifestyle where i do it professionally as well as I engage in it socially and 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 um recreationally for my own fitness and wellness and i get to meet great people like you hey that is tell people how old you are so they can realize how <laughs> that that is 
Tell people how old you are so they can realize how fit you are at this age. You're not some old fat dude. <laughs> okay, thank you, Lee. I'm 55 years old and <laughs> still competing. Um, I didn't do a triathlon last week like Stephanie. I, I've done one, I think it was three weeks ago, and I will be doing a, another one, Escape Miami, uh, September 20th. I will be doing another triathlon. Okay. And, I, and I do credit the water and, right. and the joy of the water and the rejuvenation rejuvenative factors or benefits of the water to my fitness and my and my se right. my sense of That's wellness right. so i want you to encourage them to get up uh off the um couch and get rolling now you you're here locally i mean when i say locally i know people looking at this all over the country but you're in the fort lauderdale area people can hit you up email you get involved Give them some contact information. Yeah, well, if you go to the Diversity Aquatics website, you can join any one of the councils that are listed there, and you can actually friend me on the on the the website. You can actually become part of my group or uh, an, a request to a friendship with me, similar to Facebook. But you can also join any of the councils. So once you click on a council, you will be uh, an invite message will be sent to the chair, and they will accept you. Um, so I, as well as all the other aquatic council chairs, are accessible through the Diversity in Aquatics website. And I would be remiss if we didn't talk about the outstanding work that Thaddeus, Kareem Edwards, and a lot of people were able to do Kareem Edwards over at the Boys and Girls Club of Broward County with International Water Safety Day. I'm, I'm plugging you, Kareem. Tell us, uh, summarize that, that, that outstanding uh, day, International Water Safety Day, and some of the partners that came out and participated. Sure. Um, International Water Safety Day was celebrated this year in 2015, May 15, 2015, at the Boys and Girls Club, the Jim and Jan Moran uh, Boys and Girls Club in Deerfield Beach. The director is Kareem Edwards, and it was his idea initially, along with uh, Sean Anderson and Miriam and a collection of us, who planned to have an International Water Safety Day event there. And then we were fortunate enough to reach out to a collection of local people, aquatic professionals, as well as members of the community. And we had over 200 children uh, taught a variety of aqu aquatic lessons from water safety to scuba diving to uh, underwater archaeology to um, triathlon water polo and the majority of the people that were presenting were diversity and aquatic members or friends of ours or, or, or uh, people in our network that came and were very passionate. We had a former mayor, we had a city council member, we had um, uh, uh, Charlie Lumpkin in particular, he uh, showed some of the uh, underwater sea lodge classroom under the sea videos from an expedition he did in Key Largo and we talked to Charlie earlier so some of you saw that already and then we followed up with that the week the, the next week uh, another DAP a diversity aquatics member Les Burke uh, the founder of junior sciences under the sea uh, also did a discover scuba and uh, introduction to learning to swim at the Deerfield Beach um, pool in the city of Deerfield Beach and then we were honored and received a a Broward County School Board resolution at the Broward County School Board meeting and uh, for uh, our work at um, celebrating International Water Safety Day at the Boys and Girls Club and we, it was actually televised so I was pretty uh, pretty it was a pretty uh, celebrity now oh yeah <laughs> okay <laughs> yes yes a little bit <laughs> I'll take a little bit of celebrity if it furthers the cause of water safety and drowning prevention and increasing diversity so that comes with it so I'll, 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 I'll accept that That's cool. <laughs> uh, that is uh, final question what does it do for you personally uh, to see young folk as well as older people but in particular young folk getting exposed to all of these uh, activities as it relates to aquatics that you couldn't have dreamed of being exposed to when you were coming up uh, it, it gives me, it invigorates me to, to do more. It gives me a, a passion and a sense of purpose that about it that I didn't have when I was just a, doing my own thing. Um, being connected to this network and knowing that we're affecting people and seeing the results firsthand uh, is amazing. Um, I am honored and pleased to have my turn at in, in this, in the history of, of mankind, if you will, or at least in this society, to make a contru contribution that's bigger than myself and be part of a team and having fun while we do it. But it's serious work, but we enjoy it while we do it. Well, great job. We could, uh, Diversity Aquatics couldn't have done it without. That's it. That's all. Oh, thank you. And it's going to continue on the Thaddeus' leadership of the councils, 
Uh, more activities are going to be happening in the future. More things are going to happen this weekend here at this conference. This is the first day of the opening of the conference. The con this is a Friday, people. Uh, tomorrow, Saturday, more will be happening, and it will run through uh, Sunday. That is off the top of your head with about two minutes. Tell us some things that are going to happen tomorrow and how we're going to conclude on Sunday. Well, tomorrow we're going to participate in in-water activity where we're actually going to get in the water our, our uh conference and convention participants. We're going to play and, and practice different uh, um, techniques at reducing people's fear of the water. We're going to use different equipment such as a, a deep water running belt or a, what's called an aqua jogger belt. Um, we're going to actually introduce a little bit of water polo. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to do a little rowing exercises. That's going to be done by USA Rowing and America Rows representative Richard Butler and he's the rowing council chair. He's going to introduce a rowing on the ERG machine, which is the machine that they practice rowing on on land. Uh, we're also going to do um, a simulation of an open water event where we actually swim without lane lines and without touching the walls. We're going to go that's a workout, man. Oh yeah, that's a workout. Yeah, we're actually also going to go underwater. We have people that um, some of the participants, if they we're we're inviting to go underwater as we did last year with a certified scuba diver. Where we go underwater and we're, it's it's uh, confined, it's in the pool, so it's it's very safe, and uh, we have uh, certified lifeguards and scuba divers on 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 duty, so that we're you know we're everyone's trained properly to at least go underwater safely and surface safely. Excellent. So uh, people out there, when you think about aquatics, don't always think about drowning. In fact, let that be the last thing you think about. Think about once you learn how to swim, once you get comfortable in the water. All the many, many physical learning, fun activities that you can do once you learn the fundamentals of swimming. How you can broaden your perspective, many sports. You can go out on a jet ski, you can water ski, scuba dive, snorkeling, triathlons, uh, rowing, just all these myriad of things that are out there. If you think about it in a bigger way, don't think about learn to swim to keep from drowning think about learn to swim and be able to do all these other great things drowning is just like way in the rearview mirror because once you learn how to swim you're not going to be thinking about drowning anymore you're going to be thinking about moving staying healthy and enjoying the water that is thanks for coming to join us it's my pleasure thank you for having me lee